Good evening once again. At this time, I will invite everyone to stand as we invoke God's presence into this evening's proceedings. Thereafter, we will remain standing for the national anthem. Eternal God and our Heavenly Father, the one in whom we live and move and have all been, the one in whom there is no variableness or shadow of turning, the embodiment of wisdom and knowledge. We give you thanks for bringing us to this inaugural lecture tonight, a lecture that deals with transforming lives, navigating challenges, shaping the future, designed to help us to understand transformative change despite the challenges in St. Vincent and the Grenadines. In a special way, we want to thank you for our presenter, lecturer, the esteemed and renowned, the Honorable Dr. Ralph Egon Savage, Prime Minister of St. Vincent and the Grenadines. It is common knowledge that he is a confident and eloquent speaker, one who knows to articulate his position without fear or favor. But tonight, dear Lord, I pray that as he presents, the audience here and those online will understand what he says, help him to connect with everyone who is listening. And Father, may we understand that St. Vincent and the Grenadines needs to keep moving on. Thank you again for your love, your mercy, and your grace. And may tonight's session be a success in my prayer with thanksgiving in Jesus' name. Dr. the Honorable Ralph E. Gonsalves, Prime Minister of St. Vincent and the Grenadines. Other members of the Cabinet of St. Vincent and the Grenadines, members of the Diplomatic Corp, senior public servants, Mr. Augustine Ferdinand, Director of the Institute of Governance and Politics of Latin America and the Caribbean, Dr. Mineva Glasgow, Human Resource Consultant, Project Manager. Chairpersons and Chief Executive Officers of Statutory Corporations, members of the business community, specially invited guests, members of the media, ladies and gentlemen, good afternoon. <laughs> this afternoon, we will witness the inaugural lecture of the Institute of Governance and Politics, an institution that was established to serve as a platform for civic organizations, national and regional experts, and representatives
from diverse sectors, including youth and politics. At this time, I will invite the director of the Institute, Mr. Augustine Ferdinand, to bring welcoming remarks. Thank you very much, Mr. Lachman. Dr. The Honorable Ralphie Gonzalez, Prime Minister of St. Vincent and the Grenadines, members of Cabinet, the Speaker of the OECS Assembly, Honorable René Batiste, members of the Diplomatic Corps, senior public servants, Dr. Mineva Glasgow, manager and human resource consultant, chairpersons and chief executive officers of Satter Corporations, members of the business community, specially invited guests, members of the media, ladies and gentlemen, a pleasant good night. This evening, it gives me a great pleasure to welcome all of you to the Institute of Governance and Politics inaugural lecture. This is a significant step forward in our mission to promote knowledge, public engagement, education, and understanding of public policy, global challenges, and the pressing issues facing our society today. Today's lecture, the theme, Transforming Lives, Navigating Challenges, Shaping the Future, a story of transformative change in the face of challenges in St. Vincent and the Grenadines. This theme captures the essence of our collective vision as we are not only here as observers, but as active participants in this story of resilience and progress. This evening, we are delighted to have Dr. The Honorable Ralphie Gonzalez as our keynote speaker delivering this lecture. Prayer, of course, to his active entry into politics, he was a lecturer in government at the University of the West Indies, and of course, he practiced law for many years. This evening, Prime Minister Dr. Ralph Gonzalez will guide us through the country's socioeconomic transformation, weaving together the threads of adversity, resilience, and unwavering human spirit, despite numerous challenges over the years. These challenges, of course, include the 2008 economic crisis, natural disasters such as hurricanes and storms, as well as ravages of climate change, and of course, in 2020, our experience with the pandemic and also the Lassifer eruption. Also, he will discuss in his lecture the significant progress we have made as a society, as a young democracy, good governance, foreign policy, education, health, gender equality, and overall socioeconomic transformation across St. Vincent and the Grenadines. Once again, ladies and gentlemen, I extend a warm welcome to each of you on behalf of the Institute of Governance on Politics of Latin America and the Caribbean. It is my hope that today's lecture and the insights gained will give us a broader understanding of public policy and the ongoing development of St. Vincent and the Grenadines. Thank you. Thank you. <clears throat> Sorry. Thank you, Mr. Ferdinand. As we proceed with the rest of this agenda, I will ask the Naked Roots cultural organization to provide some entertainment. Naked Roots cultural organization, please. Thanks. Welcome them as they come.
Okay, folks. Greetings and good night to everyone. We're going to warm you up with some riddlements. One day, I was going up Bill Isles. I meet a man with seven wives. The seven wives have seven kids. And the seven kids have seven tits. How much people have been going Bill Isles? How much? <laughs> All right. If one is a double and two is a crowd, what is four and five? <laughs> Somebody get it. All right. You buy it to eat on Christmas time. You go put it on your table, but you will never eat it. You buy it to eat. And when your big Christmas come on the 25th, it's on your table and you ain't going to eat it. Catch the... Now. Nah. Oh, they can't catch the word. All right. Hear this now. Christmas will come. In St. Vincent Grenadines, 2023. There's a new Christmas tree. Everybody in St. Vincent carrying it around in their hand. What is the name of that Christmas tree? Eh? No. No, I'm going to tell you a little one day. <laughs> okay, folks. No, mama culture. Just for mama, big for mama culture, I'm going to tell she. A palm tree. Now, we call this one, we call this one climate change. Are we going to suggest some ways to deal with climate change in St. Vincent and Grenadines. Help the Prime Minister in the lecture. So we say, what is it, what is it? Climate change. All you feel in it. Climate change. All you know about it. Climate change. All you hear about it. Climate change. If we want a solution, we have to practice if we want a solution, we have to practice reduction. You believe that? Climate change, increasing pollution. Climate change, rising the sea, go on the east coast, you go see. Climate change affecting all community. Climate change affecting the economy, ask Camelo. Climate change affecting, affecting mental health in the country. Climate fate affecting food security. Climate change affecting global warming. I see the ozone layer, it depleting. Now if the ocean get warmer, the rainfall gonna get heavier. You believe that? If the ocean get warmer, Lord, it's destruction, hurricane, flood, and disaster. So we say, what is it? What is it? What you say? Climate change. All you feeling it? I can't hear you. All you know about it? Climate All you hear about it? So the question is, how can we reduce climate change in SVG? All are we? We'll leave it up to the Prime Minister alone. What are we going to do? Well, let me give you a suggestion. We have to take action for the young generation. You believe that? How can we reduce and be resistant with climate change? We can't fight it. But we have to take action for the young generation. So what are we going to do? We're going to reduce waste and recycle. When? Right now, right now, right now. We're going to plant up a backyard garden. When? Right now, right now, right now. We're going to keep every community clean, our scholars. Right now, right now. Plant a 
tree and eat locally. Not Kentucky. Right now, it's right now, right now. We have to prepare ourselves for global warming. Right now, right now, right now. We must encourage energy conservation. Right now, it's right now, right now. We would reduce fossil fuel in this year land accident. Right now, it's right now, right now. We go reduce carbon footprints in this year our land. Right now, right now, it's right now. So what we say? What is it? What is it? Tell me. Climate change. All you feel in it. Climate change. So what is it? What is it? Climate change. Clean up the river, clean up the sea, clean up the beaches for all of we. Clean up the river, clean up the sea, clean up the beaches, clean up the environment for all of we. Clean up your heart, clean up your mind, clean up your soul. It's love all the time. Clean up your heart, clean up your soul, clean up your life. It's love all the time. Clean up your heart, clean up your soul, clean up your mind. It's love all the time. Why? What is it? What is it? Hey, time. What is it? What will you say? What will you say? What will you say? We hope you enjoy that, folks. Climate change is indeed real, but if I'm to describe that performance with one word, it would definitely be unique. I'm wondering if the next performer will be able to top that one. At this point in time, I will call Mr. Maxwell Francis. I'm not sure if anybody here knows that name. But if I say Tajo, then you will definitely know who I'm speaking about. Let's welcome Tajo as he comes to the stage. Pleasant good night, everyone. I'm going to do a peace call. I borrowed this from the Prime Minister. I'm going to call this peace Fresh Hope. Since 9 11, the world we know it ceased to exist. Then came the money meltdown that triggered an economic crisis. The impact and challenges for a small island state like us were many. The economic shockwave throughout the world was heavy. And for us in the Caribbean, the impact wasn't easy. Yet, we respire fresh hope. Then came globalization. Adding to our already long list of frustration here in the Caribbean. And just when we were positioning ourselves to cushion the impact, boom, COVID-19 brought to our door a pandemic, testing our very existence to the core. But did we buckle and fall? No. Instead, we respire fresh hope. Life as we knew it seeks to exist. New impact and challenges were brought on by this pandemic. Social distancing became the new normal. To be well-dressed and wearing a mask was formal. A wave of death flew across the Caribbean, testing the limits of our health institutions, while ordinary men and women became experts on vaccination. And the internet crazies went wild with disinformation. Still, we respire fresh hope. And just when we thought the wars was over, Lassofre decided to test our patients further, causing mass evacuation while it wreaked havoc and devastation. And just when we thought we couldn't take it no more, Hurricane Matthew came knocking on our door. But still, we respire fresh hope. Our resilience as a people have been tried and tested. Government finances stretch long 
with human resources. It goes to show that if we work together as a people, we can overcome any adversity. Proud to be Vinci, let's build this legacy. Once again, we respire fresh hope. Thank you. Fresh hope indeed, Tajo. A lot of persons are trying to steal that one, but fresh hope. Moving on expeditiously with the rest of the agenda, I will now ask the National Performing Arts Guild to grace us with a cultural presentation. This is Shania Jackson reporting for SVG Maybe TV I'll News on the, the radio. 7th of November 2023. And I bring right, to you these details you, right? of tonight's proceedings. Ah, As Vincent just prepared for what you. they thought was going to be a major success, was turned into a day of deep mourning and sadness as a flood deviated the south leeward end of the country. Flood? What is this I'm hearing? Disaster in the morning? People losing their value things? to have contributed to their living? Nah, 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 this could never be. This could never happen in my country. St. Vincent and the Grenadines, land of the blessed. We are too blessed to be having all this disaster and suffering. Ah boy, what to do? Good evening, everyone. This is Shania Jackson, and I bring to you these details of tonight's proceedings. More news? It was stated in a press release that the COVID-19 virus is now circulating around St. Vincent and the Grenadines, and it is becoming a major threat to our nation. I am Samantha John with these details. Forces flood. No, it's pandemic. But we are really seeing here. Ah, boy. Everything happened for a reason. That's what they always say. It's it me bangali. I find it. <laughs> Look at here, boy. Look at here. The latest blackberry in tongue. You see it? You see it? Ah, boy. It's really calling me. At this hour in the morning, three o'clock in the morning, after I just reached 7 p.m. Ah, boy. <laughs> you know it's who? It's Janice. <laughs> let me answer, let me. Yeah. I don't set myself right. Hey, Janice. What go on? Ah, slow down. This is not fountain stretch, nor is it Argyle long stretch. So pull up your brakes and talk to me. All right, talk now, talk now, talk now. Janice, is Laya lying to me? Were you talking about pandemic? If it's me little thing, then you see me wife having she covered that you want. I know you're not Janice. Every time you see my wife has something in she cupboard, you want it. Pandemic this and pandemic that. 
Every time you get it, the, the, the disaster that Nemo say coming, it turn back miraculously. And the supermarket get the things them in stock. Hmm. Wait, you hang up call on me? No problem, my wife in the back. <laughs> oh boy. But wait. Janice never did serious when she begin. It must be true. Oh, how many more, Father? Questions, questions without answers, answers. I'm convinced. I'm convinced that St. Vincent and the Grenadines will not. Him boy will not. <laughs> ah, boy. That we will never go through anything worse. News? Again? And in breaking news, the last of volcano has just erupted. Residents are advised to stay indoors at all costs. Ash would be falling heavily, according to the National Emergency Management Organization, NEMO. Persons with health conditions are advised to wear masks and to stay indoors to prevent any further damage. Residents living in the red and yellow zones are kindly asked to remain at home until authorities arrive to escort you to a shelter. Stand by for further updates on this pressing issue. Mabel, stop your foolishness to get me out of this house. Both volcano and volcano. You know what is a volcano? Both volcano, this and volcano. That... My bang are ringing? You didn't hear it? Well, that mean you older than me? <laughs> Jesus Christ, boy. CNN calling. CNN is calling. And she always calling on video. Like she phone can't do nothing but video. Ah, oh boy. Ah, oh, father. Janice. Locust for the Egyptians. Janice for Peter. Janice, where you want? You don't hang up phone pan me. Four, five, six. Yes, I'm holding grudge. I hear you. I remember when you hang up the phone pan me when I've been talking about the COVID-19 pandemic. Now you're calling back my phone? Tell me what tell me. What? Last of Fred Europe? But Janice, you in the Barbados, how you know Last of Fred Europe? Eh, hey, Janice? Janice, listen to me. You is one of them crosses that see us walk up and down the street looking for trouble, you know? I don't have no goods and I have nothing to give to you. But wait. Janice, you're talking truth? But how come me and... Oh, crap. <laughs> a real old on our boy. Janice, I hear the news report, but I think it's maybe been thinking me. Oh, Father. But Janice, we really have to be grateful in spite of. Because even though flood come and take we, we still stand. Even though COVID pandemic come, we still stand. Even though anything come rat run up and down, Pat and Mary go down the road and play marble, we still stand. Because we are resilient. We are humble. We are people of class. I don't know if you have class or not, but me get first class. <laughs> but we are, Mr. Up say we, I am a person of class. Jan Jan Janice, don't hang up the phone. Don't hang up the phone. You are a person of class too. Wait, wait. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We are persons of class, Janice. We know what to do and we know when to do it. And we all stick together. That is why we are called Vincentians. We are resilient people. But wait, Janice, I really want to talk to you now because I love when you call me. You never want to call me now. But anyways, I have to go to Methodist Church Hall because the Prime Minister of my country, St. Vincent and the Grenadines, is giving a lecture, an important lecture, at Methodist Church Hall for seven o'clock. But see, he said reach for six, right? You, you hear me say? He says seven o'clock, but reach for six. Not, not Vincent and time, Janice. Don't come for eight. Come for six. So, so I will catch up with you when I come back. Eh? All the best because we have to fight on in spite of. All right. Hang up the phone, Janice. I don't know how to. Hang up. Ah, yeah, she gone. She gone. Let me go tell you. Let me go tell you. Let me go Get up, stop complaining. It's a universal thing. From sunrise to sunset every day.
We are resilient indeed. And, and we stay true to the national anthem in that our faith will see us through. The moment we have all been waiting for is here. I will solicit the assistance of the parliamentary secretary in the office of the prime minister, the honorable, the senator, Shakel Bob will ask her to introduce the Honorable Prime Minister, our featured speaker this afternoon at this first lecture for the Institute of Governance and Politics. Shakel Bob. A pleasant evening, everyone. Please allow me to establish, to adopt the protocol that was established. Dr. the Honorable Ralph Egon Salves received his education at the Connery Roman Catholic School and the St. Vincent Boys Grammar School in St. Vincent and the Grenadines. Subsequently, he successfully obtained a Bachelor of Economics from the University of the West Indies, where he also held the esteemed positions of President of the Guild of Undergraduates and President of the Debating Society. 1971 marked the completion of his master's program in government at the University of the West Indies. He earned a Doctor of Philosophy in government in 1974 and a degree of Otto Barrister in 1981, both from the University of Manchester, England and Grays in London, respectively. He became the Prime Minister of St. Vincent and the Grenadines when the Unity Labour Party won the general elections held on March 28, 2001. He has remained so up to the present time. Prior to him becoming the Prime Minister, Dr. Gonsalves practiced law, particularly in the fields of constitutional law, administrative law, matrimonial law, real property law, law of tort generally, and law of contract. Additionally, he possesses extensive writing and research experience as an author, having published numerous works on trade unionism, the Caribbean, Africa, comparative political economy, and developmental issues in general. Among his latest publications are History and the Future, a Caribbean Perspective, published in 1994, The Politics of Our Caribbean Civilization, Essays and Speeches, published in 2001, The Making of the Comrade, The Political Journey of Ralph Gonsalves, published in 2010, Diary of a Prime Minister, 10 Days Among Benedict Benedictine Monks, published in 2010, the Case for Caribbean Reparatory Justice, published in 2014. Our Caribbean and Global Insecurity, published in 2017. The Making of a National Hero, Law and Practice in St. Vincent and the Grenadines, published in 2018. The Political Economy of the Labor Movement in St. Vincent and the Grenadines, published in 2019. The Trial of George McIntosh and the 1935 Uprising in St. Vincent and the Grenadines, published in 2020. The Atomized Individual, the Social Individual, and the COVID Vaccine in 2021. The Idea of Barbados in 2021. A Time of Respair, Beyond COVID, Volcanic Eruptions, Hurricane Elsa, and Global Turmoil. Fresh Hope for St. Vincent and the Grenadines, published in 2022. Without further ado, Please welcome our esteemed guest speaker, Prime Minister of St. Vincent and the Grenadines, Dr. The Honorable Ralph E. Gonzalez. Let's recall some great men 
who's been fighting for our rights. Let's recall some great men who's been fighting for our rights. Let's recall some great men who's been fighting for our rights. Thank you. Let's recall some great men. Thank you, Madam Chairperson. Sorry, Chairperson, and thank you, the Senator Bob, for the introduction. And good evening, everyone who gathered here, and those who are listening on radio or viewing through the streaming. Very happy to be delivering the inaugural lecture sponsored by the Institute of Governance and Politics, Latin America and the Caribbean, the educational research arm of the Unity Labour Party, of which Augustine Ferdinand is the director. I'm sure that at some time, Augustine will speak to the programs of education and research which the Institute intends to pursue. I'm very pleased to see so many young people here, including those from the community college. And of course, for those who have come from distant parts of St. Vincent to be here on a Monday evening. The lecture, the subject, transforming lives, navigating challenges, shaping the future, a story of transformative change in face of challenges in St. Vincent and the Grenadines. Of course, this lecture can be the subject of a doctoral thesis. Therefore, what we, can, what we are going to do is to sketch <clears throat> some of the central elements in this particular subject, and we can have a conversation after the formal presentation. As always, it is important that we begin with the meanings of concepts. To define things, what we consider them to be. Of course, I've always held the position that definitions are never right nor wrong, only more or less useful. And it depends on the utility of the definition in order, in relation to the subject, in order for us to have a better understanding. Clearly, there are certain things if you define them differently than everybody else, they will have no salience or utility. I can't define the structure, which is known as a desk, as a bus, because I'll be offending elemental definitions agreed upon by everybody and which are laid out in dictionaries which are accepted. It's part of the common discourse of language. But very often, people get so thoroughly immersed in having angels dance metaphorically on the head of a pin about definitions that really is to begin to have some first level clarity as to what we are talking about. And as the discourse unfolds, we, we have a full understanding and meaning of the subject 
which we are discussing. That's why I say definitions, really, never really, and not right or wrong, only more or less useful. And one considers the utility of it in relation to the subject matter at hand. Now, if you go into any publication which addresses transformation, you will find a number of words which are synonyms. Conversion, metamorphosis, renewal, revolution, radical change, reconstruction, remaking, reworking, recasting, reformation, refashioning, um, revamping, transfiguration, change over, mutation, overhaul. One gets the general idea. And of course, the antonyms, those which are contrary to transformation, are preservation, conservation, stasis, status quo. So when we are talking about transforming people's lives, we are talking about a fundamental change, a metamorphosis, a thorough refashioning and revamping of what existed hitherto. But clearly, transformation is not something which it doesn't exist yesterday and it doesn't exist the next day. No, transformation is a process. Even when you have a revolution, and a particular day is declared as a revolution. The 1st of January, 1959, the Cuban Revolution. The 13th of March, 1979, the Grenada Revolution. The October Revolution in Russia. You have convenient starting points, but really, Transformation is a process. Then, the concepts which we'll use tonight, which relate to this discussion, would be allied ideas of growth and development. Of course, growth refers to the the quantitative enhancement of a particular structure which exists, a particular condition which exists. In economic terms, is measured by the aggregate of values in the, as gross domestic product. And there are persons who would say there is growth, but there is no development. But development contains growth because for there to be the movement from one structure to another, and importantly, a different function from another. It involves growth. Let's, let's take an analogy. By analogy, let us take water. Water heated to 100 degrees Celsius becomes steam. But until it becomes steam, room temperature water is clearly of a different nature altogether than water which is less than 100 degrees Celsius heated because you'll have hot water to make your coffee and your tea. I don't think anybody wants to have coffee made with room temperature water. So you, if you sniff at growth, say, ah, that is just growth. That doesn't have any transformation, doesn't have any development. Well, the actual thing itself grows. And then at a particular point, 
it is transformed, it develops into something else. In this case, water is transformed into steam, which has a different structure and has a different function. A lot of these things just cause a lot of confusion, or never to cause confusion, because when you strip them of all their apparent complexities, they are really straightforward. You just have to apply your mind to them in some critical way. So normally, let's take the, the trunk of a tree will grow in diameter, it will increase. It remains the tree. It remains the tree. Of course, a tree which has grown larger can provide you with material for furniture, whereas one which is not yet mature may not. And the people who, 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 who deal with, with, with trees like, for instance, the hardwood tree of, of, of um, green heart will tell you that the inner part of the green heart of the mature green heart tree is not the part which is the best part. Neither is it the outermost part, is the part between that which is outermost and that which is innermost. But yet, that is growth, but different parts of it has different functions which can provide value, can provide utility. Let's go on an example. Of course, clearly, what is growth, what is development, is when you plant the seed in the ground and it comes up from the, it germinates, it comes up from the ground. It is an entirely different um, structure altogether from the seed which you put in the ground. But that small sapling has to grow. But you don't sniff at the growth because it is something which is of value which is created. But you take a tadpole. You remember when you're in elementary biology, they talk about the metamorphosis of the tadpole into the toad. The, the tadpole would have different structures and those structures would provide different functions. But when it becomes a toad, and the process of growing and it's transformed, it becomes a toad, it's a process, it becomes something very different. The, 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 the caterpillar transforming into a butterfly. I think I've given enough examples so that we can see the connection. And, and transformation is more akin to the issue of development but in the process of growing, you are also in the process of transforming. If you get to a, an end, which when you look at all the indicators, you are in an essentially different situation than you were hitherto. Let's take life expectancy. When I was born in 1946, I wasn't born in the 16th century, though William Shakespeare and I have been friends for a long time. But when I was born, at birth, the statistics will show you that the average lifespan of a Vincentian was 47 years old, so for 47 years. The average lifespan. The average lifespan of a Vincentian today is 74 thereabouts. The women, for some reason, their average lifespan is a little longer than the men, even though they 
they, they give birth to children and I've been advised that that's a very painful process since I have not experienced it. <laughs> now, clearly, no one can say reasonably if the average lifespan of a Vincentian male moves from Forty-seven, just after forty-seven years, just after the war, to seventy odd years now. That that, in terms measured in terms of lifespan, that is a transformative thing. By itself, it doesn't tell you that there is total transformation in the society, but because it is so fundamental, it is indicative that there has been a transformative process ongoing. Not yet reaching its culmination, but ongoing. Then, the, the, so that transformation really, in a, in a simple, in a straightforward sense, is a marked change in form, nature, or even appearance. But certainly, its opposite is conservation, is preservation, its stasis, its status quo. Now, speaks to the issue of challenges, and I'm trying to clear the decks first. Navigating challenges. We have a lot of challenges, and the challenges are internal, homegrown, autochthonous, and there are challenges which are external, which come upon us. There are challenges which emerge from human activity, challenges which occur from nature, and challenges which arise from your or very extant condition. What are some of the obvious challenges which we have? St. Vincent and the Grenadines consists of 150 square miles of land and about 11,000 nautical miles of sea. We have a population of about 110,000. We have no gold, no diamonds. We have fertile soil. But we have limited land on which we can grow things. In fact, as our country grows and indeed develops, there's less land because we have more houses. For instance, in 2001, you had under 30,000 house, households, which means independent groups independent houses, but you have now about 45, 46,000 46, households, which means that from 2001 in 20, you had about 28,000, so you have about 18,000 houses since then. That's a huge number proportionately and I don't think if you check if you check proportionately in the United States of America you will see such a growth in houses between 2001 and 2022 23 
doesn't mean the, the, the percentage, while it gives some indication, you can't make a final judgment on that for the simple reason that the base on which you start in the United States in 2000, in 2001 would be a much larger base. And the extent of the growth which you would have is, is likely, and in fact, it has been smaller proportionately, percentage-wise. In, in 2001, so the lands that you have, no, you have more lands with houses. There are more lands with buildings, more lands with plain fields, and so on and so forth. And there are less arable lands, therefore. St. Vincent has, um, on mainland St. Vincent, you have, you have nearly 90,000 acres of land. Between ourselves and the Grenadines, it's just over, plus about 100,000 acres of land. Just over 100,000 acres of land. Thereabouts. Using wrong numbers. But you have probably now under 20,000 acres for agricultural purposes. 16, Sabi says. It means, therefore, that if you want to address that challenge in respect of agriculture, you have to improve the efficiency of your cultivation in order to enhance outputs, food security, and the like. It means applied science and technology, and so on and so forth. Then, in 2000, you had just under 30,000 persons making payments as active registrants at the NIS. You now have about 43,000, indicating, therefore, that you have 12, 13,000 persons more registered, the bulk of whom are employed. Because when I, when I, when I hear some of the unemployment numbers, I turn to the, to the best proxy data which we have, which is the, the NIS. And while you may measure economic growth with GDP, you will tend to measure development in a more multidimensional way as, for instance, the Human Development Index of the United Nations Development Program. And St. Vincent and the Grenadines today They have low, medium development, high development, and very high development in terms of the Human Development Index, measured across a range of indicators, not just economics. And St. Vincent is at a high level of economic, of, of um, human development measured on the basis of the HDI, which would include education, health, housing, levels of income, so on and so forth. So we have obviously seen over the period, given some of the indicators that I pointed to, significant enhancement, undoubted growth, and you can point to transformation in terms of development. You look at indicators. But I want to take us <clears throat> one, 
with this process of transformation, with a historical perspective, to see how the material core of the country has addressed, that is to say the economy, has addressed the challenges which we have. And we're talking about challenges, small size. But small size doesn't, in, and scarcity of certain material resources, the small size by itself doesn't mean that you will be in a condition of underdevelopment. Singapore, for instance, is a very small country, bigger than us, but, and, and it is a country in which there has been tremendous development and is seen really as beyond a developing country into a developed one. We have internal challenges arising from our some matters present in our nature. Volcano. We have by our location, our geography, we are prone to natural disasters and we are one of the countries in the world which is most prone to natural disasters. It's extremely vulnerable to natural disasters. But how, just by way of indicating, how do you address that? You address that by educating people about natural disasters because we can't change where we are. You can't pick up St. Vincent and Grenadines and carry to Vladivostok or the mouth of the Amo River. What you do is that you take it where you are because if you go to Vladivostok, there are certain natural challenges you're going to meet too. So don't think that there's any way where you're going to find it perfect. What do you do? You educate people, you build more resilience in a more resilient manner. You prepare for natural disasters. You set up an institution like Nemo. You staff it, you, you build um, satellite warehouses. You, you do a number, you set up institutions and you do a number of things to cope with that particular um, challenge. You have a resource called people. But people who are not trained are a limitation. Because if you don't have people who are trained <clears throat> in science, technology, and manning production apparatuses at an efficient level, you're not going to make the most of what you have. But how do you solve that problem? You solve that problem by having, for example, an education revolution. So there are challenges, but they are how you meet those particular challenges in the process of transformation, in the process of development, which involves growth, which is quantitative, and development is quantitative and qualitative. <laughs> the, and then there are matters which are part of our history, which are challenges. Native genocide, the enslavement of African bodies, the historical legacies of colonialism, including a peculiar personality type which is created in the Caribbean, which has been created in the Caribbean through colonialism and the nature of the material base that we have had, which is to, to say an authoritarian personality, as it's placed in the, uh, discussed in the literature. There are lots of sociological literature on this in the Caribbean which oscillates between submission and aggression. 
And in fact, colonialism has created such a terrible psychological debilitation on colonized peoples that even when, for many persons, even when they're in high positions of authority, sometimes they feel themselves even subordinate to something mythical, something which is not there. And all of these things are embedded. How do you address that? You address that by liberating your thinking and becoming an individual with a level of consciousness and understanding of the world and your place in it to free you from these debilitations. But you have, there are possible ways to deal with the various challenges. Then there are external challenges. And the external challenges in the global political economy. Big powers want to determine for you what you should be or do. Our currency is tied to the US dollar. <laughs> if the dollar is weaponized, the US dollar is weaponized against you as it has been weaponized in the case of Cuba and Venezuela. You see the challenges that 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 that, that um, provides. But what you do to help to insulate yourself, you have solidarity among like-minded nations. And we ourselves in the Eastern Caribbean have formed ourselves into a monetary council and shape that in a particular way. And then there's the monumental existential challenge of climate change. And man-made climate change is creating a condition in the world, and we see it manifested in our region, where we are having more frequent natural disasters, more severe ones. And this matter is of great urgency. Indeed, the current budget for the year 2022, over 60% of the capital budget is devoted to adaptation and mitigation in relation to climate change to actually correcting what has, from the, what climate change has done to us, or preparing to lessen any impact of future damage arising from man-made climate change. And the same thing is going to happen to the estimates which we are now do, discussing. Over 60% of it relating to this matter. And that's why it is important for all countries, including and especially developing ones, to go to Dubai for the Conference of Parties, the 28th edition of the Conference of Parties under the United Nations Framework Convention on Climate Change. And then the ex external challenges which come upon you, <laughs> some things out, completely outside their control. What's happening in Ukraine? Disrupting supply chain problems and um, creating difficulties with us getting commodities, increasing prices. Same thing happening from Ga in Gaza at the moment, manipulation of the stock market, the rising interest rates overseas in the United States of America. <clears throat> and then there are people who tell you <clears throat> that Ralph is responsible for the increase in oil prices. 
And he, they said to you, you elect me and there will absolutely be no increase in oil prices. You know, we control oil companies, we are, we are, we are producers of oil, we are OPEC, you know, ah, oh, you know, those from Beckway have a magical one which those from Connery are not possessed of, that this, this issue will completely be solved. It's, it's, just, it's just pure demagoguery and foolishness, you know. And it is in all of those things that we have to talk about the concepts, talk about the challenges internal and external. And how, how have human beings in St. Vincent and Grenadines over the years tried to deal with the internal and external challenges? Some from nature, some man-made, some systemic. How is it that these societies were organized? Let's address something which is bedrock. The economy, the economic arrangements. From the time the British assumed suzerainty of this country in 1763 until the dawn, the declining years of the 21st century, 20th century into the dawning years of the 20th, 21st century, what we have had from 1763 to the declining years of the 20th, 20th century is either a, a colonial economy or an amended colonial economy. What are the essential features of a colonial economy or an amended colonial economy? First of all, is the dependence <clears throat> principally on one main agricultural crop. In 1764, they began sugar. And of course, African bodies were enslaved. Later on, of course, indentured servants came from, were brought from Madeira and then from India. So that's the first thing. You had sugar. Then you had arrowroot. Sometimes you have sugar and arrowroot jostling. When sugar by 1881 collapsed, arrowroot became dominant. <laughs> and then you had the 1898 hurricane, mash up all the, most of the arrowroot factory and the remnants of the sugar factory. Then you had the 1902 volcanic eruption, which further destroyed the arrowroot. And for a while, cotton emerged as the principal export crop. And then, of course, there was a resurgence in sugar until sugar um, collapsed in 1961-62. There was a little reintroduction in the 70s, late 70s under the Labour Party administration and then brought to an, an end by the Mitchell government. And then Arrowroot, after the Second World War was dominant until bananas came in. In fact, during the Second World War, the main exports, because people wanted food in Trinidad and Barbados and so on, was growing provisions, you know. You, you check the data, you find it. But still, all part of the 
dependence on one single crop. Then bananas emerged in the mid-1950s, and it jostled with our root for a while, and then it became completely dominant as green gold until 19, until we began to see changes in the regime when Britain entered the single market and economy at the beginning of 1993. And then in July, when you had a new banana regime coming into play, into play and it suffered diminution in protection between then into the early 21st century and bananas went away for all flesh. But up to that point, even when we arrived in office in 2001, you had expo exports of about 30,000, 20 something thousand tons of bananas, of course, in its heyday in 1992. You exported 78,000 tons of bananas with an export value of $120 million, Eastern Caribbean. $120 million Eastern Caribbean in 2000 and in 1992, which is now 30 years ago. That's almost, that's double really in, 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 dollar, in, in, in value. That was what was cut out from under this country. So the first thing about a colonial or uh, amended type colonial economy is a look a single agricultural crop. Then what is associated with this? What is associated with this is production with low level of skills, development, um, economic value being created by a large supply of unskilled labor. Third feature of the colonial or amended colonial economy is product, the production apparatuses have limited technology. A fourth feature of a colonial and amended colonial economy is the external trade relations were based on preferences burns. You can, you can watch the progress, you know. The, and for most of this period of time, when you had um, a colonial or amended colonial um, economy, you had a colonial type constitutional order. Of course, after 1979, we have independence. Um, and there is an attempt by governments after independence to see to what extent you can begin to diversify. But yet, there's bananas, which is still the mainstay, maintained by the preferences and very fairly low levels of technology. And by the way, though bananas were green gold, and, 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 and I want to make this point because all things of matter, M-A-T-T-E-R, everything in the real world, or indeed even ideas, possess a duality. And one of the challenges with bananas is that, in my view, it has been singly the most environmentally degrading cash crop, legal or illegal, that this country has ever produced. Because 
They extended the subsidies in the early, uh, in, in the heyday of bananas, f propelled farmers to cut down trees above the 1,000 foot contours to grow bananas, causing a lot of landslides and all the rest of it, denuding of the land of trees. Then, of course, the, the matter of the use of the plastic, which is not biodegradable, to sleeve the banana, because the British housewife didn't want to see any little pin spot on the banana, even though you and I know that the pin spot banana was the sweeter of the bananas. Some would say the sweetest of the bananas. Um, but they were rejected. And then, of course, something which it has been investigated, but from anecdotal evidence, a lot of people who are suffering from lung problems today and who are dying in St. Vincent and the Grenadines from lung problems is not because of smoking, some of them from smoking, but because of the use of pesticide and weedicide in a manner which was not um, safe. I have a family member who has a lung problem. And he went overseas and the examination. And they said, had you been using pesticides and weedicide? He said, yeah, I used to spray bananas bare back, bare foot. They picked it up in the, in the analysis. So even though it's green gold, it also has other sides. I, I'm, I'm, not, I'm not making any adverse comment about people who profited from bananas and the like. No, I'm just speaking towards the issues at hand as we are seeking to address the problems as they arise, the challenges as they arise in aid of our transformation, our development. Now, when the ULP came to office, we said, that we want to make a break with a colonial or amended colonial type economy. In part, frankly speaking, you had no choice because sugar had gone, our route was just in the, the northeast of the country, bananas the, 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 the preferential arrangements were declining rapidly. So, something had to be done. Unfortunately, under the ancient regime, that is to say the regime before our time, no serious consideration was given for what is fundamental in any post-colonial econ economic arrangements. That is to say, education, science, and technology. Oh, to be sure, there was a tinker in here at the margin, but there was no focused national policy to construct an education revolution to lay the basis for the transformation in the society and in the economy. That's fundamental. Remember I told you that a defining feature of the colonial economy or the amended colonial economy was production at a fairly low level with workers with a low level of skill and education and technology. But that which you are constructing, you have to make sure that you train people 
for the modern political apparatuses and um, economic apparatuses. And then, of course, you, you, you have in, in this process of engaging in the quest to build a post-colonial economy, you had to have it many-sided, not just one thing. You still have agriculture as an important pillar. By the way, I just, imitation is really the best form of flattery. I just, I brought with me, I made a point in Parliament on Thursday, and I was asked if I want to claim the word pillar. In all our manifestos, we have been using the word pillar. The first time the opposition is now using pillar is the, the leader of the opposition announced that they have an econ the, the economic thrust is to be based on four economic pillars. You heard them. P I W L A I S. And of course, I don't have any monopoly on the word pillar. No, no, I, don't have any, I don't have a monopoly on the word hope either. Because I wrote a book published last year called A Time of Respair, Fresh Hope for St. Vincent and the Grenadines. They didn't call theirs fresh hope. They called it hope. Well, there's stale hope. There's false hope, and there's fresh hope after a period of convulsions and COVID and volcanic eruptions, global turmoil and the like. But going back, on page 41 of the manif our manifesto, big. On the, in, in this section, our economic pillars. And we address it, we address the economic pillars. Agriculture, forestry, and fisheries. And under that we had A, agriculture, always a pillar. B, fisheries, a growing sector. C, forestry, vital to our survival. D, medicinal cannabis industry. Then, what are the other pillars? Tourism, jobs, economic linkages, and foreign exchange. Manufacturing, information, communication, technology, and two niches for growth. International financial services and international medical schools. Well, I mean, I, I, I understand that The best form of flattery is imitation. You know, and uh, you even choose the words, the very words. It's flattering, but it's not the genuine article. The imitation is never the genuine article. The genuine article is always the original one. No, <laughs> the So we arrived, we arrived at building this post-colonial economy. We said we are on a quest to build a modern, competitive, many-sided, post-colonial economy, which is at once national, regional, and global. Foundation, education, science, technology and go into different areas, as I outlined the different sectors here. Then, we don't, nobody owes us a living to give us preferential treatment. So we negotiate with the European Union. First, we had a the Economic Partnership Agreement, which is post Cotonou. And then we have negotiated the Samoa Agreement, 
but all you can get from person. Here, this is part of the building this modern, competitive, many-sided post-colonial economy to structure a comprehensive agreement. But then you have, and I will come to that, as to how you manage transformation politically. You have people, prelates, whether, whether they're in charge of archbishoprics or, 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 or ordinary prelates of a lesser status, not necessarily lesser importance, but lesser status, that they see some words which they're ascribing meanings which are not there, saying that the agreements say that you will have, it means same-sex marriage. It means transgender. It means abortion. Well, none of those things is in the agreement. None of those words are in the agreement. And though the Europeans are not innocent, of their, their quest to impose their own values. But none of those words appear in the agreement. Of course, there are words which no doubt they may wish to ascribe meaning, but we would ascribe those words meanings which we understand them to be, which is a different meaning from their own meaning. And this is a 20-year agreement. We will do a number of things, economic, trade, and the like. And there will continue to be argument about these things. It's as I pointed out, if you, there's, a, there's a lovely summary for it. There are two Greek words, if you join them. They've come, they come into the English language. And you can look it up on your, on your phone. L-O-G-O-M-A-C-H-I-E. There are different pronunciations for it. Some say, depends on where, Logomachi, Logamachi. What it really means is an argument, a struggle over words. And that's the best way in which I can conceptualize this um, by using the Greek. The, these, these Greek words which have come to, I, I'm sure you all look it up while I'm talking and you'll see the, the meaning. It's a very interesting word, which, which L-O-G-O-M-A-C-H-I-E. Struggle over words, uh, argument over words. But different people have different understandings of what those words, and words mean. And we are parties to the agreement and we say what they mean to us. And of course there will be debate continuing, but none of that imposes upon us any obligation to change anything in our laws touching and concerning these questions of our values um, as we have understood them traditionally. Now, we had to go and build um, in order to go seriously into tourism. One of the things you need clearly was to build an international airport. Because without it, you wouldn't have sandals and you wouldn't have the increase in the number of hotel rooms. And you can't have, it is true that you can have yachting tourism and you can have cruise tourism, but the still over visitors, which are that which, that category which brings the most money and people will come and you'll, for entertainers and people selling their, their fruits and vegetables and, 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 and craft and all the rest. You need the tourists to come here to stay. You know, one of the, and then, of course, you needed modern telecommunications, you needed competition, you needed advanced technologies, 
which is what we have and which you have seen through the CASIP program, through the additional ICT programs which we are having. We are moving quite rapidly and we have to face the cutting edge of artificial intelligence. And in preparation for what is already upon us, that is why we are seeking the resources to build a modern science, technology, and innovation laboratory center for our young people beyond the facilities that we have. This is how you do it, which is transformative, you know. Now I hear this talk that, oh, construction is not a traded um, sector, and the economy now is driven by construction. I want to, I want to read something which, and you, 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 you see the, how we are rolling out the post-colonial economy, and I'm giving you examples, and I've documented this all in my last book, you know. Who are we going to take? The voice of a partisan politician who is talking through his hat and downplaying the importance of construction and physical infrastructure and the investment in, 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 in um, public and public importance of public investment. This is what Michael Spence, Nobel, a Nobel Prize winner in, 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 in economics, Professor Emeritus of Stanford University. He was the chair of the Growth Report, Strategies for Sustained Growth and Inclusive Development by the Commission on Growth and Development, a World Bank study in 2008. This is what Professor Spence said in this report. No country has sustained rapid growth without also keep him up, keeping up impressive rates of public investment, infrastructure, education, and health. That's the first sentence. I want to read it over. No country. It didn't say no country save and accept St. Vincent and the Grenadines. No country has sustained rapid growth without also keeping up impressive rates of public investment, infrastructure, education, and health. Far from crowding out private investment, this spending crowds it in. That's the second sentence. It paves the way for new industries to emerge and raises the return to any private venture that benefits from healthy, educated workers. Passable roads, reliable electricity, and he could have added airports. The risk attendant on McDowell in building Maya Investments is reduced significantly because of the construction of the Argyle International Airport. <coughs> and Butch Stewart made it plain that unless the, A the Argyle International Airport was here, he wasn't bringing sandals to St. Vincent and the Grenadines. Rainforest Seafood said the same thing. Then, <laughs> instructive too is this advice from the same growth report on the policy underpinnings of sustained economic growth. Notice what he said. You can't have rapid economic growth without public investment, sustained. You know, last year, we did 6% economic growth. This year, Camilo, we're doing five point something. 
Next year, we're going to come close to 6%. And the following year, we're going to be hovering around 5%. Two years in the region of 5%, two years in the region of 6%. That's 22 percentage points increase. And you, you, um, you compound them. So that in four years, the GDP of this country is projected to grow by nearly one quarter, which is highly impressive. And the investments in the public sector, $650 million at the port, it's already creating connections within the economy currently. And when it is complete, it will have spin-offs with other industries and it will deliver a more efficient port. And through that efficiency, will lessen any harm of any increased prices globally by not adding towards the cost by having your port very expensive. Because inefficient ports add to the increased cost of commodities. This is what the policy underpinnings. The policy underpinnings of sustained high growth create an environment of high levels of investment. Sanders is investing over $550 million down there. Maya is $20 million. Korea's out at Diamond. Two sets of investment. One is $28 million and one is $7 million, $35 million. People don't take, private sector people don't take their money and put it down unless they're pretty sure that they're going to get returns on their investment. And it reflects confidence in the economy, in the government, and people of St. Vincent and the Grenadines. That's the reality. Now, the policy underpinnings of sustained high growth create an environment of high levels of investment job creation, competition, mobility of resources, social protections, equity, and inclusiveness. All of those, you can describe what we are doing. Our view, that is to say the view of the commissioners of the, for the World Bank for this report, our view is that an understanding of the dynamics and a focused attention on the policy foundations will significantly increase the chances of accelerating growth. Conversely, persistent inattention to them will eventually harm it. There are many different recipes for a pasta. The precise ingredients and timing are different for each. But if you leave out the salt or boil it too long, the results are distinctly inferior. You know, I normally say we have to be creative. And like in the book of Ecclesiastes, you try something in the morning, you try something in the evening, you don't know whether both going to succeed one or the other. And you take risks at the same time, reasonable risks. This is what the growth report further advised, sensibly. The ingredients for growth cover a wide range from public investment and exchange rates to land sales and redistribution and the energy and will of the private sector. A list of ingredients is not enough to make a dish because no single recipe exists. Timing and circumstances will determine how the ingredients should be combined in what quantities and in what sequence. To 
come to that conclusion, which is sensible, you must have not only information, which is easy to get on the internet, you have to have knowledge, that is to say, interrogating the information. And having got knowledge, to arrive at understanding, which means establishing certain hypotheses about causal relationships between different phenomena. And test them along the way to get understanding. And that's before you make a decision. You then apply your heart to wisdom. Notice. A list of ingredients is not enough to make a dish because no single recipe exists. Timing and circumstances will determine how the ingredients should be combined, in what quantities, and in what sequence. Clearly, you have to build the port, but you have to build the airport first. Eh? And while you're building the airport, you can do some other things. You can build the Rabaka Bridge to link north and south because the communication is important. And you can put down, when they were saying, how they taking so long to build modern medical? First of all, they said, don't build it. But when you're building it, taking long because you're spending most of the money which you have in relation to Argyle. But you're still proceeding to build modern medical. And you're doing the schools. Because education, science, and technology, you, you, you put in the institutional arrangements. You integrate the community college. You put a law for that. You set up an accreditation board for higher education. You put a law in place for that. But because we need technical people, you put in a SSD, the Sector Skills Development Agency, there's a law on that. When we went to Parliament with it, the opposition said, well, what are you doing with that? You can't give a, you're all just creating institutions for creating institutions. They didn't see, see the vision. They say, an education officer can do that. But they didn't see that you're going to take the SSDA to take persons who are alone the trade, not through school. Brother John, but who learn it in the old apprentice way and doing some things they, don't, they know what they're doing, but they don't know all the reasons why they're doing it. So you have some modules in education organized for them. And then you certify them with a Caribbean vocational qualification certification. And then you proceed, which is another dimension I'm coming to. You go regionally that they can move freely. They then have a CARICOM Skills National Certificate to improve themselves. And then you have an NVQ, a National Vocational Qualification, which is just a step down below the CV. And then, of course, in the old colonial and amended colonial model, while integration was being dealt with, an insufficient focus was placed on the details of economic integration and the functional integration and cooperation. And we did that in the OECS, and we did that in CARICOM, with a single market and economy, moving out in stages. And then globally, your foreign policy must build your capacity to enhance your own ability to deal in the most efficacious way with the challenging external environment and to do so in the interest of all people's humanization. That's what we do. So for example, 
through our foreign policy. We built Argyle International. We got no money from the World Bank. No money from the Caribbean Development Bank. No money from the European Union or the European Investment Bank. None of the traditional institutions. And the opposition said, the problem is with the funding of this. You ain't sure where the money coming from. You start a thing and you don't know where it is coming from. Eh? But you have, a clear, you have an idea where it's coming from. You don't know everything precisely. But they were thinking in old ways. Yet, they are face enough to say hope. Well, the, 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 the Hebrews, Luke is a born again Christian, Sabi is. Now, Hebrews speak to the issue of hope. He is to be able to embrace the things not seen. Well, we embrace hope there. And after COVID and the volcanic eruption and all the convulsions, we have to up that to fresh hope. But we did it not only with hope, but we took other critical ingredients. We did it with faith, and we did it with love. It's not an accident that we opened it on Valentine's Day. God love was in the air. exactly where we're going. He knows it, he knows it, he knows it, he knows where we're going. No. In 2001, St. Vincent and the Grenadines was at the medium level of human development, measured on the Human Development Index. Today, it is at the high level of the HDI. We have made immense advances in education, in health, in housing. Remember, you know, it says that here, these are the policy on the min underpinnings of sustained high growth create an environment of high levels of investment, job creation, competition, mobility of resources, social protections, 
equity and inclusiveness. You can't have inclusiveness in the society unless you help poor people get their houses. That is not only a social question, it's an economic question of the first order. When we went to the people in 2020, I want to read what we said. The ten foundational, the ten foundational elements are. Let me let me begin first of all with the Unity Labour Party again restates its vision, its fundamental philosophical tenets and the cornerstones of its policies and programs in every sphere of human, social, economic, and political activity in life, living, and production. Without these basic foundational elements, no political party can properly govern in the people's interest. Without these as our charts and compass. The ship of state will be rudderless and it will run aground swiftly. These ten foundational elements are one, a people-centered vision. Two, the philosophy of social democracy. Three, our Caribbean civilization. Four, good governance. Five, our economic approach, that economic approach is the tripartite, is the private sector, the, the cooperative sector, and the state. Six, the quest to build a modern, competitive, many-sided post-colonial economy. Seven, the central economic outcomes, jobs, um, increasing opportunities, equality of opportunities, um, low inflation, stable currency, and the like. Eight, the Sustainable Development Goals, 17 of them. Nine, a mature regionalism, and 10, an efficacious foreign policy. This is the way which you can carry out. It is in those foundational elements you carry out the process of transformation to improve the lives. No. From what I've been describing and the outcomes, and we can talk about them, St. Vincent Grandin is on the right track. that persons within the country are, in some respects, and in some cases, in many respects, dissatisfied? Yes. But people are, at one and the same time, satisfied but have dissatisfactions. People think that human beings, this is an either or matter. You come from A and together in solidarity with each other, we come to J. But you want to go to XYZ? So you have satisfactions, but you also have dissatisfactions. The question is to understand how you came from A to J and the process that you are embarked upon to get to X, Y, Z. But even when you get to X, Y, Z, it is in the nature of human beings continuously 
to have other satisfaction, other wants generated. Even when your needs may be satisfied. Because it is that which drives human beings to invent new things, to seek more, to seek better. That is a philosophical proposition as old as the hills. And it is a reflection of the reality. So when somebody tells me that, you know, I'm dissatisfied about this. I'm dissatisfied about some things too. But that doesn't mean that I'm not satisfied about men. First of all, I'm very satisfied that I've gone past the three score and ten. But I wish at 77 I could have done some, I could still do some things when I was at 40. You know, I'm not asking you to, 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 to embark on a process to think that when I go to church, my favorite hymn is Precious Memories. <laughs> but it's the, it's the, you have a particular kind of toilet, you want a different one because the one you have, there's a plumbing issue with it. There is some... You, 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 you thought it was okay that this particular car which you had, it's a different one you want. It's so, it's, they're always, I mean, come on. So when, you, when anybody tells me, oh, comrade, I have my dissatisfaction, my answer is me too. <laughs> I said, but having talked about your dissatisfaction, let me talk about your satisfactions. And we have to have the understanding. I give the example. We give a young man a scholarship because he's, he's a national scholar. He reaches. He gets it. His education is costing us, costing the taxpayer $600,000. Yes, that's the cost of a medical degree today. He comes home, gets his internship. Makes four thousand something dollars as an intern. Then he gets a job as a medical officer. Went to university at 18. Graduates when he's 23. He gets his medical his job as a medical officer, medical officer at at 25. He goes to Bank of St. Vincent and the Grenadines. He gets, because he's now employed with the government, he gets a mortgage for $400,000 on the basis of now his doctor's salary. With no down payment because the policy of the government had no down payment. So by the time he's 25, $1 million is invested in him at university and also through the policy. He has to pay back the 400000 that's fine. He's satisfied with all of those things. I'm sure he has dissatisfaction with the way some senior do doctor talked to him, that the nurse whom he likes him paying attention to him, but paying attention to somebody else. I'm sure, I'm absolutely sure. But what really gets his goat up, he buys a $30,000 second-hand car, and in the last kilometer of the road, there's a pothole there for six months, a year. He worried about the spring and the shocks of his $30,000 car. Which spring and shocks already have problems, but they're exacerbated by this pothole. He has to have the understanding, not just the knowledge, as to what has given him all the satisfactions and to take that dissatisfaction within the context of course the pothole must be fixed but this is called proportionate thinking <laughs> you know and it's fine 
It won't in it all. Sister Rene, fine. I have no problem with that. But what I'm saying, we have to have the understanding from, from there. Now I've been talking. As you notice, I've been talking with the subject in a very expansive way to bring everything together so everybody could understand. I haven't spoke, I've given examples of this or that. Um, I want finally to say this. Nothing is possible in transformation, in development without people. Nothing is doable without quality, strategic leadership. Nothing is achievable without mobilizing the requisite resources. And nothing is sustainable without specially crafted institutions to carry the development. These eight words, people, leadership, resources, institutions. Possible, doable, achievable, sustainable. Those eight words, you could write a whole book on them. We have just mobilized through people, working with people, different types. Leadership, mobilize resources. And we just mobilize. 68 million US dollars worth of resources from Saudi Arabia. That has to do with foreign policy. 68 million US dollars. 66 soft loans, 20 year money, five years, grace, 2% interest. That we $2 million is a grant. In fact, today we got a further grant of $300,000 to deal with some software related thing, US dollars. What are we spending this money on? We have taken $16 million already to Parliament. What are we doing with these $16 million? $10 million, US I'm talking about. We're going to build a cultural, artistic, education, and production hub at Bellevue. In that facility, we're going to have for training in the artistic and cultural field. We are going to have a room where you can have an orchestra practice, and we have to build a national orchestra, and discussion is going on about that. There will be facilities there for teaching cutting edge technology. The drummers will have space for them to, a room to drum. We'll have 150 seats for people to do their creative work, as we saw here. The production side of it would be dealing with some agro-processing because the community is also agricultural. Agriculture is still a pillar, but you're moving into matters of cultural imagination, matters of the arts, the creative arts, and you're also addressing technology. And there's going to be a satellite hub in Peter Bodell and one in Trumoka on the leeward side of the island. A lot of talented people in all of these areas. Then six million dollars is going to be spent on health. 
You're going to have Sultrivers, Diamond, Connery getting money out of that. Then there are $50 million in loans. Over $13 million is for building houses for the poor, the indigent, people who have disabilities. Then, a significant sum of the money is to be spent on education, including a, Tibet, a modern Tibet center down in Union Island. You're going to build a modern secondary school, the first one, in East St. George. You do it at Brighton. We have money to rehabilitate other schools. The health facilities. In the stronghold of the lead of the opposition, we're going to build a modern clinic in Paget Farm for $1.2 million. In central Kingston, they have sent, agreed now that between the, the, the Minister of Urban Development and, and the representative for central Kingston, the, the, the land is in, well, the part in Sharp is more problematic, so they're going to do it at Lodge Village, just a stone throw down, so you can take Sharps, Green Hill Lodge Village, that catchment area. We have to buy the land for nearly half a million dollars, 470 something thousand dollars. That's coming from our resources. There's a 1.5 million US facility. Calaqua, which is a growing area with all the business and the community is getting larger and larger. It's the fastest growing constituency. They will have a polyclinic there. Stubbs will have a citizen, citizen security facility, a, a modern police station, and there would be some monies to spend on, on um, other citizen security facilities. What is the objection to all of this? The objection to all of this is that the leader of the opposition says at his rally, misnamed the Hope Rally, he, he says that the problems in St. Vincent and Grenadines are not big enough for me. I had to go, I had to deal with all problems all over the world. But I went to Saudi Arabia and I have 68 million US dollars. I'm not spending the money in Ukraine nor in Gaza. I'm spending it in Large Village, in Union Island, in Paget Farm, in Kialakwa, in South Rivers, in Diamond. I'm, we are spending it in housing all over the country. Anybody thinks that you can transform the country without interfacing with the rest of the world? I began by saying we are 150 square miles and 11,000 nautical miles of sea which makes that important for the blue economy. But Earth has at the moment 8 billion people. 110,000 stand in splendid isolation. And the number is likely to be, to be declining, and so certainly the growth would be very small because the, the, the young women through their educational advancements, have decided that they're only having one child. But we need to encourage that, at a minimum, you have 2.1 children on an average. One to replace the mother, one to replace the father, and, and point one to take care of some migration and population growth, and I'm making a serious point, which means that every tenth woman should have three in order to have an average of 2.1. The, the, Renee's laughing. 
<laughs> I am, I am. So, the, the women have their part to play, and so do the men, because I don't think the women can do it alone. <laughs> so, so, all of these things are connected to our development, to our transformation, and building lives through all the challenges that we have. Thank you very much. If you give a little more than you take And if you try to fix more than you break If you're the kind who takes the time to help a stranger in the rain Definitely an informative speech by the Honorable Prime Minister Growth is a process, and over the years, the Honorable Prime Minister has grown in leadership. This country has grown, will continue to grow, and benefit from his growth amidst the challenges. Well done to the Honorable Prime Minister. At this time, for about 15 minutes, I will open the floor for questions that will be targeted or directed to the Honorable Prime Minister. There's a stand in the middle there. Persons who would like to ask a question, you will utilize that mic. As, as the first person is coming up, Prime in. I just want to say one thing. The, the, the development and the transformation which we are going through has its particular com uh, complexities because you, you have to do it within the framework of parliamentary democracy, competitive parliamentary democracy. In some other countries, you don't have those complications. Uh, but even those with one party states, they have their own set of complications too. But I'm just saying the political system we have, just as a matter of fact, that they have com complications and contradictions arise in the execution of policies to aid transformation and development in, in, the, in the interest of the people. Because it is the business of the opposition to oppose, even when there is no reason to oppose, because, and, and, and they oppose, because frankly speaking, Friday wants my job, and Leacock and Cummings wants Sabi job, and Camilone, and so on and so forth. It's, the, you know, it's a fact of life. So there are contradictions in that process and complications. <laughs> Thank you for that, um, Prime Minister. I think the Honourable Minister has the first question for you. Yes. He has been taking notes for the entire night, so over to you, Minister. Yes, Prime Minister. Now, we, we boast of the education revolution. As we deepen the education revolution, do you think we are at a stage whereby we should have a more careful attention as to guiding students to study certain areas which, from our assessment, from the productive sectors that are necessary? So as it pertains today, you have persons who go to college, and then you hear someone say, well, I want to be A, or I want to be B. But in terms of how that will contribute to their own development and the advancement of the country, 
Do you think it's time enough now that we have a structured conversation to direct more of the young persons? Because if you don't do that, you may actually have persons going away to study certain things, and when they return, they can't fit in as neatly as is necessary for the growth of the country. I, as, as you know, as you know Sabi, what you say is absolutely correct. But it's how you achieve it. We have priorities. We have accepted at cabinet, we have a list of priorities. The areas which we are, we are encouraging students to study. I don't think that the priority list is sufficiently disseminated and the priority list has to be updated on an ongoing basis and it has to have increasingly a sharper focus on matters of science, technology and innovation. So that's one area. The second matter of which we have to address is this. Even though you may have your priorities internally, students are on the internet and they're seeing some possibilities in some other areas because they want to study not just for the local and regional economy they want to study things for the global but they have to be aware that in 2050 which is 27 years from now you my brother you're how old now 17 18 19 so in 2017 in 20, 2050 you are going to be 46 so you have to consider and when you're at 46, you're likely to be working up to 75 by the time you get there, by the time you reach 75. Because people are going to be living longer. I mean, even when I was born, I, as I said, the average lifespan of a Vincentian at that time was 47 years. But I'm now 77, but I have ambition to be like, to go the distance like Isaac, son of Abraham, and make 110. <laughs> I don't know whether I'm going to make it, you know, but that's, but, but really, you, your, your generation is going to live, well, already at birth, your, your life chances are long, and the way people are living and they're working, health and wellness and all the rest of it. You, 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 you're going to have a long work in life, longer than in earlier periods. So you, you have to gauge what it's going to be like there too. And AI, artificial intelligence robots, going to replace a number of people in a number of functions. Of course, people may well work less hours because robots is doing more that's how technology is. Um, and then, of course, you have to take into account what somebody genuinely loves and their, appet their, 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 their appetite for it, for whatever they're doing. But the point you make is very critical that we need to train persons to suit the production apparatuses nationally, regionally, and globally, increasingly. Um, having said that, the most important function of education, in my judgment, is to train critical minds to receive and transmit universal culture, including science and technology, but with the Caribbean particularity. Because once you have a trained mind, you can easily move and shift from area to area and to be retooled. Those who find it difficult to retool would be those who don't 
to have their minds trained properly in a critical manner to receive and transmit universal culture, including science and technology, but to the Caribbean particularity. I, I, um, I just want to say something to the young people who are here. And those on, you may say, are you not overrating the changes which would maybe taken technologically? I remember reading an editorial in the early 1890s of the Times of London. I wasn't then in London reading it, though some may think so. Subsequently, I read it, and I was struck by this editorial. Look, there was a big conference in London to discuss the question of how are you going to rid the streets of London of horses, OFAL, O-F-F-A-L. Because it was piling higher and higher. And the editorial thundered, unless this conference finds a solution, in 50 years' time, there would be really no way for people to move in London. There would be too much of it. But by the early 20th century, the combustion engine had been invented and motor cars were, 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 were being um, used. And the matter of horses or fowl on the streets of London was taken care of by technology. And the 50 years that um, the, the, the Times editorial was worried about, there were powerful planes dropping bombs on London. And in 1945, the hydrogen bomb was dropped on Nagasaki and Hiroshima. So, the technology, and this is, these things, these, all these changes take place, took place in a 50-year period. <laughs> so if you have context, and you have to bear this in mind, human beings began to think conceptually about 70,000 years ago. But man existed, human being existed, millions of years before, at least the species from which Homo sapiens evolved. <laughs> um, and there were others of our family, you know, but we were, we were more intelligent and we, 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 we organized and we helped kill them out, you know. Um, and we have survived as the, the dominant force and so on. And the, the, so you, 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 look, uh, you look at the perspective of history, and it's important always to have it. And we can solve as many problems as we can during our three score and ten and whatever you get by reason of strength extra. But believe me, there are going to be problems and challenges when we leave. Got it? so long as human beings exist. But we have to understand how human civilization has evolved and have a large concept of it and then narrow it down to your own lifetime as to what are the immediate challenges or those which are foreseeable. Good night, Prime Minister. It is a so big privilege for me to listen to this conference, and I would like to thank you for that. And I have a question. Do you think that in any country uh, with no participation of the state uh, in the productive area or apparatus, or as, you, as you call, uh, could achieve a high level of transformation in other world. Uh, it is possible that a positive or internal or external transformation 
uh, in a capitalist economy? Well, the state, even in the capitalist economy, has assumed a very significant role, both in owning resources, means of production, and very critical in regulating mm -hmm. production apparatuses and the whole society. You're not going to be able to have the level of transformation unless the state has a leading role. Indeed, <clears throat> a, the market by itself <clears throat> cannot produce the transformation. Even, even the research which is done in the advanced capitalist economies, the research is paid for largely out of public money. You know, this, that, that's, that's just the space research, for instance, from which a number of spin-offs come. I am making notes at the moment on a book that I hope to write on the relationship in this period and going forward between the state, the market, civil society, and the individual. These are challenging questions which will arise, which have arisen, and which will continue to, to affect governance. Um, there is money and banking. The state has a, a vital role in it, even where the state don't own banks. The, the regulation themselves. The, and there are some societies, as we have seen coming out of China, a large society big country like China is the state which has been able to drive the rapid development. In an earlier period, the state established re rules and regulations for the United States to keep manufacturing products out, to strengthen their own manufacturing industry. So it's very difficult to, to for the state not to play a leading role in helping to direct um, the economy. So I, I will answer you yes on that. And the historical experiences um, bear it out. In fact, in the United States of America, there are people who will say that the one political party with two wings, the Democratic Party and the Republican Party, two wings of the same political party, which has a pact with monopoly capitalism as to what they will do and what they will not do. Um, just before you proceed with your question, I'd like to inform everyone that in the interest of time, this will be the last question that will be taken. But there's another one, too? Okay. From the students. Okay. I know the Honorable Prime Minister will facilitate those two questions. But if there are other persons in the audience with questions, there will be more forums like this. And I urge you to come out. and. Um, that probably might be another time for you to ask that particular question or whatever questions you may have. So we take your question and then we take the other two and then we close the session. Thanks. As political leader for the past 22 years, how have you been able to transform yourself to fit the times? Transform myself to? Yes, fit the times. <laughs> by, 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 by reading, 
and listening, <clears throat> including listening to young people a lot. Um, and listen to not only teenagers and people in their 20s and 30s, but younger. And talk to them and they, they, they tell me many things. And I read constantly. I have to, I have to read. Um, and I, I will urge you to do the same thing. The, the, and I keep my head young by reading, by listening to people, including young people. Sometimes I meet some young people and I talk to them. I say, but why are you so conservative? Why, why, are you, why are you so cautious? Why are you not um, trying to ask more questions and you know, push the boundaries? Because it's the, it's, the, it's the only way in which we are going to encourage change. And I will tell you, the older I become, the more radical and the more impatient that I get. Uh, good night, everyone. Good night, everyone. All right. Taking into account all your experience, how do you think the lack of economists have impacted our country? And do you see a need for more economists in Simpsons and the Grenadines? Well, it depends on the, first of all, eco economics is a, is a field um, of, of academic professional pursuit and, and it's always um, helpful to have persons who have studied economics, not, not only study it in a formal sense, um, at university, but study it on an ongoing basis. The, if, if you have a study of economics, where economics, or if you practice economics, essentially as a series of technical functions, the aggregate of technical functions, <clears throat> you miss a lot of things. Let's take, for instance, <clears throat> let's identify, my brother, you, you study economics, features of the components of an economy. Work, um, the, the, the wages and salaries, profits, rents, money. Unless you, unless you study what happens behind the real flesh and blood people be behind re wages and salaries, that is to say the working people you will miss a lot. If you study just the technical functions in relation to profits, you will miss if you don't study the capitalist or the entrepreneur. If you're dealing with rent and its technical functions and you don't address landlords or landladies, and behind money, is the state, in our context, a democratic state in which the people in the executive are elected by real flesh and blood people, call an electorate. And as you study economics, you will see that the, the market, for instance, you can't study it as a perfect competitive market, 
free enterprise. In St. Vincent and the Grenadines, we have a few dominant businesses. Let's take flour and rice. We have one company that produces them. Of course, you can bring in rice and you can bring in flour. But the company which is here has an advantage by being here. You take banks. The Bank of St. Vincent is by far the largest commercial bank in the country. It's a, it's a trendsetter. I answer you yes, but I say I want to raise for you to look at economics in a wider sense than in the traditional study of it as a series, the aggregate of a series of technical functions. That, that's, 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 that's what I would put. I mean, I, I have studied economics formally. I just finished reading a book called Techno-Feudalism. And the former Greek foreign minister and intellectual Yanis Varoufakis says that the big companies which control in now technology, information technology, have made, have, are in the process of transforming the economy into one which is feudal, in which we pay rents to be in their domain, in the way in which the guys who owned the land hitherto had the, the serfs or the villains pay rent for the land. And a, a difference in this case, we pay to go in the, the, on their domain, but we create the content. We pay to, we, we pay to create the content on Facebook on Instagram. We are working for them, but we are paying them. Very interesting, eh? No, traditional economics doesn't give you that perspective. <laughs> um, good night, everyone. So my question for tonight is, what roles do you see young people playing in transformation of the country? Oh, I mean, it, it depends so much on you. So, so much on you. Look, you are now 18 or thereabouts. We have invested in you seven years in the primary school, five years in secondary school, that's 12. We are investing in you two years at the community college, that's 14. And between three to five, more than likely, we invested in you at a preschool. And we are going to invest in you another between three to five years, depending on what you're going to do at university. And we, that money is being invested in you because you are supremely valuable. Without you as a trained, educated person, and every single young person develops skills. We are doomed, and to the extent that any young person does not take 
the training and the development and, the, and, 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 and an overall development. Um, to that extent, the future of our country is diminished. And that's why it pains me so much when I see some with all the opportunities going through education, yes, set, on-site, prime, the whole set of targeted specific initiatives. But some people, some, some youngsters choose, particularly young males, some young males, to go to crime because Two things are sure. Once they stay on that track, they're either going to die young or they're going to go to jail young. And that's, that's before us. And if you notice the way in which the governments which I had, the investments which we are putting in young people, this year, we budgeted $42 million for post-secondary and tertiary education. That's separate and distinct from the scholarships which we get from Taiwan, Morocco, Venezuela, Cuba, etc., etc. But I was told that today, there was a special warrant for a million or million and a half dollars additional. The number which is going to be in the budget for 2024 is going to move from 42 to a number closer to 50 million. The same amount of money which we have spent on the police annually and what we have spent on the hospitals in this country. In an incredible amount of money at that level. I'm not talking now secondary and primary and pre-primary and technical and special education. I'm, not, I'm just talking post-secondary and tertiary education. That is why, for instance, we are investing so much in sports facilities and cultural facilities and you can get the difference in perspectives. And from different people who are offering themselves. And you saw the debate in Parliament on Thursday. You might have heard it. There's a bill to the House to extend borrowings by $35 million to pay for the facilities for World Cup cricket 2020. Buying lights for over $4 million, screen, and a number of things. Improving the facilities there, doing some things at Annisville 1, Annisville 2, sorry, Cyan Hill and not Cumberland, because there has to be some um, other facilities available for training and the like. The leader of the opposition says, this matter is about economics. It is more than cricket. The dance must be able to pay for the light. Well, no. That's the position of someone who knows the price of everything and the value of nothing. My response, I said, this is about cricket. This is fundamentally about cricket and young people. You can't make back $35 million over four days of cricket. How did dance go pay for the light? The important thing is to have people come to this sport called cricket, which is an English sport but which we in the Caribbean have revolutionized. And we have used it as an instrument to facilitate our own liberation. And we play to the verve and a style. We have been in decline. We have been 
there are four in the modern period in fact historically there are only four countries or regions which have dominated international sport like us we, do, we dominated it for 15 years Cuba dominated amateur boxing for that period of time the Soviet Union Russia dominated it in ice hockey and of course if you want to put a group of countries in East in in, in East Africa especially Kenya and Ethiopia long distance running and the marathon imagine a population a set of islands with only five million people we dominate a, a sport in the world for 15 years and you want to tell me this is about economics and you draw reference to wholeness in Jamaica I must take my lead from wholeness but wholeness do or it doesn't do absolutely not this is about cricket and young people so I, I answer you well from many things I've said tonight you'll see where we are with this but I answer you in the resources which we have and I answer you philosophically and now I'll conclude my answer poetically there's an old friend of mine who wrote something in the late 18th century Wordsworth bliss was it in that dawn to be alive but to be young was very heaven the condition of youth is heavenly me is just blissful for me to be alive but not heavenly according to the poet but to be young was very heaven and make use of this heavenly condition for yourself your family and the country and humanity Okay, so, so good night, everybody. One second, please, before you ask your question. As the old saying goes, we leave the best for last. <laughs> <laughs> and that happens to be you. So, after this question, we will close out this session and move on to the next item on the agenda. You, you, Thanks. You know, Anson, uh, the former national scholar, you know, a man schooled in analytics. Mm. Um, and, and high technology, etc., etc. The the tremendous skills. He's also a cricketer of repute. He has played for St. Vincent and the Grenadines. Mm. He tells me that if he takes three months off from his work at the Ministry of Finance, he will make West Indies team as a wicketkeeper batsman. <laughs> I'm just telling you about answer. <laughs> I'm not sure if that, that is a debate, you know. <laughs> you but, hear that? It's not a debate. It's axiomatic. You can get it done. <laughs> All right. So I hope I don't disappoint. Um, Mr. Gonsalves, my question. I am curious to hear your take on how crime impacts the youth education in relation to some being disillusioned or intimidated, while others being attracted or compelled to that lifestyle, thus compromising academic and educational futures. Yes. Now, first thing I will say, the number of persons, the number of young males who have gone to crime and who have gone particularly to crimes of violence is a tiny minority compared to those like you who have chosen through the dint of your effort to stay in academics and develop yourself. Because always we must have perspective, eh? They, at any one time, you have about 390 prisoners. But at any one time, in, in 2001, you had close to that number, maybe 350. 370 prisoners but you had at the community college four or five hundred students 
Today, you have a number close to 400 prisoners, but you have 2,650 students at the community college. I, 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 I'm a man based on science, you know, and I do, I, I do, the, I give the numbers. The numbers don't, they don't, they don't, the numbers don't lie, you know. <laughs> and crime is a complicated matter. There are a lot of families. This, this issue starts in the family. In many of the households, there's not a father figure which is guiding. And the mothers are trying to hustle to make a living. A lot of mothers hustle to try to make a living and bring up their sons and their daughters pretty well. But some other households, that doesn't happen. So family upbringing is important. And I ain't talking about family upbringing here with people with money to be better parents and all that. No, 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 no. The bulk of the parents who have brought up the generation like me, families from the poor, the working people and the peasantry. So the family. Then the schools. Other than the family, the time where the, the youngsters spends is mainly with the teachers in the schools. A teacher is required to teach not just a subject, but himself or herself. Unfortunately, a minority of teachers do not teach the goodness of themselves. And students often leave the school with very jaundiced ideas. So I think that's another area. Churches. A number of young people go to church, but a number of young people stay away from church. Because too many pastors decide that they want to frighten you and me to heaven by talking about hell. I, they don't like when I talk like this. But I am so long, Sabi can't talk like this. I have a lot of runs on the tins, and I'm prepared to engage them. I'm older than most of them, so I can, you know, when you're in the business like a patriarch, I listen to them, I go to church, I hear, I say, why is he trying to frighten me to go to heaven? Why he doesn't talk to me about love and caring rather than telling me about fire and brimstone and all the rest of it? Eh? Talk to me about some things that's going to lift me and my spirit now. You can't frighten me to heaven. Then, persons in the communities, we don't have the, the sense of community solidarity anymore. There's this great individualism and everybody hustling and looking for themselves. It's a complicated business. Of course, the state has to provide proper policing, but the state has to provide and the law courts, the prisons, and all the rest of it. But this matter is a complicated one from the family coming up. And then, there's the internet. There are people see things on the internet. They want to imitate. And of course, there are some people, a lot of persons who go to crime, go to crime as a matter of choice. They choose to. And sometimes the choice is made easier if they're within a community where there is a small group who have a culture of criminality and draw them into that web. Some easy money, easy girl, easy woman. 
you know, I, I, I am not, I don't, I, I don't live in the sky, you know, I live on the real earth. So, but we have to continue to make the efforts to bring those who have gone on the wrong side to, to come back on the, on, the, on, the, on the right path and make this observation. I follow the law codes very carefully. Not through the newspapers, I get reports from prosecutors, from the police and the like. I don't see anybody going to the law courts who in Boy Scouts or cadets. I don't see anybody going to the, I don't see any young males going there who play in cricket, steel band or belong to a community organization. I don't see them fellas going people going who go into church on a regular basis. I don't see them going into the lock courts as as um, accused persons, which, which would tell you that there are organizations which exist for, for young people to belong to cultural, sporting, community organizations. You know, um, and you can be doing your work, um, engaging your academic work, do your chores at home, you can be involving your, 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 your your church, your community, your cultural group, steel band, music, whatever it is. Have fun. Go your fet. Enjoy yourself. It's a heavenly condition you have. You can do all of those things, but keep your mind focused. And remember that in 27 years' time, in 2050, you will be 46. I'll be 104. <laughs> Please, that's my intention. You're more, you, you're more likely to be then in, in, in uh, 2050 than me. But I still have the aspiration to be there with you. And when you're wrong, remember we talk like this and come up by gas and, and, and sit down with me and have a coffee. All right? <laughs> when I'm 104. Thank you, Prime Minister, for the responses. This marks an end to this segment. I will now call on Kewama Edwards Cottle to deliver the vote of thanks. All right, good evening, everybody. And I must say, this evening has been very enlightening. So, as we conclude, knowing that we are a bit pressed for time, I will attempt to make this as short as possible. Nevertheless, um, in a climate where ingratitude seems to be the, 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 the thing of the day. I do not want to gloss over this seg segment because to, um, to put off something like this, it means that there are a lot of people who have been involved and they must be thanked. Absolutely. So firstly, I would and must, I have to express my profound appreciation to the Almighty God for his blessings upon us as a nation and individuals. The songwriter says his grace and his mercy has brought us True. And we stand here today as testament to his benevolence. And as the word of our, words of our anthem say, whatever the future brings, our faith will see us through. And of course, as we heard tonight in song, we will continue to live in the goodness of God. 
Secondly, I would like to extend heartfelt gratitude to our esteemed keynote speaker, Prime Minister Dr. Ralph Gonzalez. As is expected, his insightful and invaluable contributions have enriched our understanding of transformative ch change in the face of challenges in St. Vincent and the Grenadines. And my favorite takeaway from tonight is, nothing is possible in transformation without people. Nothing is doable without quality strategic leadership. Nothing is achievable without mobilizing the requisite resources and Nothing is sustainable without specially crafted institutions in St. Vincent and the Grenadines. Thank you so much again, Prime Minister. We are also immensely grateful to Mr. Anson Latchman for his skillful guidance through tonight's proceedings as chairman. Dr. Maneva Glasgow, your invocation set the perfect tone for this evening's lecture, reminding us of the power and importance of divine intervention and help. Director Ferdinand, thank you for your welcoming remarks that gracefully inaugurated this gathering. Naked Roots Cultural Organization, your rhythmic and energetic performance served as a powerful reminder of the impact of climate change on SVG and our collective responsibility to mitigate its effects. Mr. Tadjo Francis, your poetic tribute, Fresh Hope, beautifully captured the essence of our nation's resilience and optimism. To the National Performing Arts Guild. Thank you for your captivating presentation that highlighted again our resilience and the importance of cultivating gratitude amidst adver adversity. We extend our sincere appreciation to the Methodist Church Hall Office for generously granting us permission to hold this lecture here tonight. We also recognize the unwavering support provided by the Ministry of Foreign Affairs and the Office of the Prime Minister. Our deepest gratitude goes to the technical team and organizers for their tireless behind the scenes efforts. Your meticulous preparation and dedication to excellence ensured the smooth and successful execution of this event. Thank you also to the media, including VC3, Star FM, NBC, Mr. Steve Wallace and his team for their exceptional coverage of tonight's lecture. And finally, but certainly not least, we extend our heartfelt appreciation to the in-house and the media audiences for your enthusiastic participation and attentive engagement throughout the evening. Because of all of you, because of all of us, this evening's proceedings have been both informative and inspiring as we journey along on the positive transformation of St. Vincent and the Grenadines. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, no better way to say thank you. Kiwama, thank you. <laughs> Curtains are down, safe travels to everyone, and once again, thank you for attending. Your mercy never fails me All my days I've been held in your hand From the moment that I wake up Until I lay in my head Oh, I will see Of the goodness of God mm -hmm. All my life you have been faithful and all my life you have been so, so good Yes, every breath that I am able Oh, I will sing 
of the goodness of God. You know I love your voice. 